Yes. <laughs> what is getting on, everyone? It is your boy right here. MMA Reloaded. We are live and direct. We are back. Episode 32. And uh, folks, we are coming off the heels of last night's Bellator 250. And I have to say myself, what a show it was. Uh, and I'm not sure if you guys have just followed it, but one championship inside the Matrix. Ooh, I love one championship. I love one championship, folks. And uh, I love one championship, folks. And if you get the chance to see and watch inside the Matrix, bam, 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 yeah, it is a fucking show, man. What a show it is. We will be doing the shout out for Inside the Matrix as well. Um, we have done the shout out for Bellator 250. So check out all the winners and losers on MMA Reloaded Instagram. Also, folks, uh, MMA Reloaded merch has just expanded. Keeps expanding, bro. Boom. Yeah. eBay. Go on eBay right now, man. And uh, search up that MMA Reloaded merch. The listings. Uh, only one listing ATM. But more will be coming up soon. If not, MMA Reloaded or Code UK, straight up, live and direct on the website. Uh, go, uh, go get it while it's hot, man. Folks, tonight, episode 32, the show where we talk real, we never lie, cheat and steal. We are back um, for, we are back with my brother, yeah? One of the brightest stars in mixed martial arts today. Right, I've got, I've got a lot of these guys that I, I respect. I love doing shows with uh, like Johnny Munoz, Gabriel Green, Volkan Massignani, Kevin Worth, guys like that. But Jerome Renegade Rivera, and it's always going to be a pleasure to chat with him. And tonight, folks, we sit back with Jerome Renegade Rivera um, and folks from our past two podcasts with Jerome Rivera. We have seen such maturity such involvement that has come out of him because he's gotten those opportunities in the UFC. He's won the contender series. He's made his short, he made a debut on three days notice against number 15 ranked flyweight Tyson Nam. Yeah. I mean, who does that, man? You've got to capitalize and seize the opportunity, win or lose. And Jerome does that. Um, and folks, Jerome Rivera will be back in the octagon January 21st, 2021 against Ode Osborne. Uh, a great test. Uh, folks, Jerome Rivera will be talking to us live and direct. Uh, folks, it's time to do the particulars uh, before we, uh, you know, go deep into the conversation here today. As we always do. Uh, folks, message has been sent to Jerome. The message has been sent to Jerome. Uh, so, folks, when he's ready, we'll be ready, as we always are. Uh, you know what, folks? It is such a, a great time to be an MMA fan. Of course, the uh, UFC 254, folks, the backlash of it. Uh, people still talking about Khabib Nurmagomedov. And, and what happened with that, uh, what happened with him after his win over Justin Gaethje, um, you know, retiring and promising his mother that he will retire after that fight. Uh, you know, of course, his father not being there. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's an emotional time, man, you know, when for anybody, you know, he's not thinking as a fighter when he, when he makes those decisions. 
he's thinking as uh, as a human being. He's thinking like, bro, look here, yeah, I've never been in a fight without my father in MMA, in my career, yeah? And I'm not going to start now, yeah? So if my father's not there, I will not fight. Bro, his heart's not going to be in it. His heart will not be in the performance if his father is not there. To be at UFC 254 uh, paid homage to his father because he was, uh, it was his first fight since his father, Abdul Manaf, died. And, you know, there's an adrenaline, there's an emotion that goes through your head. Uh, if you're a fighter in that sort of situation, you do it for your family. And he did that uh, in that fight, you know. Dana White is saying that, uh, you know, I've talked to Khabib and he wants to go to 30 and 0. Um, so, you know what, guys, whether you want to go to 30 and 0, whether you want to, you know, um, whether he wants to go to 30 and 0 and you want to stop at 29, who's going to who's gonna say anything, bro? Who's going to say no, Khabib, go to 30, you know? If he wants to stop at 29 and 0, I'm not going to blame him. But... Folks, there's that. There's also the um, the limerick of and the complete utter rhetoric of just who's the greatest of all time. Dana White, uh, I mean not Dana, Daniel Cormier on commentary called Khabib's career the greatest MMA career of all time. Now, folks, when someone says that, yeah, bro, it pisses me off. Hold up. So, so folks, yeah, it pisses me off when somebody says Khabib's career is the greatest career of all time. Everybody has their opinion. Yeah? Uh, okay, cool. Even though I am MMA reloaded and this is what I do for a living, yeah, my opinion may not be one that everyone agrees with, right? Yeah, and if other people give opinions as well, everyone has a different opinion. People say George St. Pierre is the greatest of all time. John Jones is the greatest of all time. Hoist Gracie is the greatest of all time. People say Daniel Cormier is the greatest of all time. Stipe. Uh, you know, so many names can get thrown into this hat that I, I say that there is not one great, there are greats. There isn't one legend, there are legends. There isn't one pioneer, there are pioneers. Yeah? So if you think that, oh, uh, Khabib's the greatest of all time because he's 29 and no, look at his resume. Compare that resume to John Jones' resume. Compare John Jones' resume to George St. Pierre's resume. Compare George St. Pierre to Daniel Cormier's resume. You've got so many different outlooks, so many great fighters over the years that have uh, come into this sport, made such huge names that you can't fathom who the greatest of all time is. If you do, there's no, there's no point. Everyone has their own favorite fighter. Everyone has, you know, uh, a guy, uh, a fighter they think is the greatest of all time. Oh, you could say Chris Cyborg or Amanda Nunes is the greatest of all time. You know, um, there's so many fighters that can be classified as being great. So why just say? that there's one goal. Why not say there are greats, legends? Pay tribute to everyone who came before the fighters that we know and love today. You know, folks, it, 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 that that annoys me. It, it it's one of the hottest topics here, and it annoys me because 
nobody, you know, even considered that there were people, there were fighters who paved the way for Khabib, fighters who paved the way for Daniel Cormier, fighters who paved the way for John Jones, fighters who paved the way for Anderson Silva, fighters who even paved the way for, um, you know, uh, Israel Asanya, Jan Blachowicz, all these fighters are so great today because they have legends and pioneers to look up to from the previous eras. Then you have John Jones on the mic continuously since UFC 253, right? John Jones has been on the mic um, spewing out so much shit, yeah, about, bro, look, yeah, look at my resume. Now, look at your resume now, yeah? And before that, before he was on laying the smackdown on Khabib at, off the UFC 254, yeah, UFC 253, he went into a hundred round social media war with Israel Adesanya. And, and what? For what? What came out of that? Entertainment. Yeah, it was fun. It was funny as hell. But what else came out of it? A lot of emotion, right? You you don't want to be the guy to, you know, you want to be the guy to have the last word always. Yeah, if you don't want the last word, yeah, you might think people might get the wrong impression. You might look like a pussy or a bitch. But, but you know what? Walking away from shit like that is probably the best thing, you know that. And if you're fucking uh, John Jones against Israel, yeah, Israel probably... Uh, Israel's probably the man, you know? Israel probably won that social media war, fam. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to... Um, I'm not going to dispute that, folks. Some of the stuff Israel actually came up with was wicked, man. He he literally took John Jones' uh, smackdown, right? And John he took some some of John Jones' shit for a while, yeah. And then you didn't hear anything from Izzy for like one two days. Then what Izzy does is he boom smacks John Jones right in the fucking mouth, yeah, with a mad ass tweet or some meme or something like that. And that fucking pissed John Jones off. He was talking about Israel's culture and where he come from and stuff. That's where you draw that line, right? That's where a line goes here like this. Yeah. And I was talking about this, folks, on episode 31 with Chaz Alex. Uh, another great MMA star, folks. Yeah, another great future star. He was... We were talking about Social media wars, yeah? Where is the best place to draw the line? Where is it? Yeah, you can't ever, you can't, you don't know until you see, you know? You can have two guys who hate hate each other, yeah? Uh, basically go, go into a fucking social media war and you're too busy being entertained to actually see where where this actually, where the line gets drawn, you. That's it, man. That's it. That's my take. Yeah, whether you want to agree with the opinion or not, um, I'm not really bothered, you know, but that's where, that's where it happens, bro. Yeah? you got to know when to draw a line and when not to draw a line. If you draw a line, yeah, at the right time, people just get entertained. People don't pay attention to it. To the uh, to the red room, bro. but yeah, folks. You know, uh, aside from that, put that shit away. Go and sweep it. Yeah. Um, oh shit! Jerome is ready. Woo! Oh, fuck, man! I'm like a kid in a motherfucking candy store. Uh, folks, I will get into it with Jerome. Yeah, check this out. Oh shit, the rope. Oh, the rope. I got to switch Yo, it. Yo, Jerome. What's up, my brother? What's up? What's up, bro? How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. Uh, give me like one second, yeah? All right, cool. I think I, I, think I fucked this up. Um, oh, bro, fucking technology. Fucking up. Yeah. 
on the podcast. So, all right. Uh, what's going on, bro? How's it going, man? I'm doing good, bro. How are you? I'm doing good, man. I can see you've got, uh, you've got a fresh trim, man. You've got a fresh day cut going on, bro. Uh, yes, sir. Had to get one to make the wife be happy. Oh, come on, man. What is it? It's date night out there, man. All right. Hey, watch. Hold on really quick. Let me close this door. Okay, well, man. Gotta make myself a little taller. <laughs> All right. Oh man, hey, now nah, Jerome, bro, it's, it's good to have you back, man. It's been a while since we uh, since we spoke like this, bro. Um. Yes, sir. Oh. It's been a while. Glad to be back. I'm glad. I'm glad to have you back, man. Uh, how's it been? Uh, how's it been going, bro? Of course, uh, you came off. You came off such a such a hard. Uh, lost, bro. You took a fucking UFC fight, yeah. Your UFC debut. You took your fucking three days notice, bro. Yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean. Uh, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll, it was. Uh, it's been a busy year, bro. It went from me being like super impatient. I'm like, damn, when am I gonna get a fight? Because all I had was that LFA fight in January. So I'm like, when am I gonna fight? I was there itching to fight, going crazy during the quarantine, and then. We fought Luis Rodriguez, and then, like, I kind of knew the word was to stay ready in case something happened, so we are back on the grind, and then, before you know it, three fights in this year already, so that's, I'm pretty happy with that. Man, I bet you are, man. I bet you are, shit, and winning the Contender Series as well um, was uh, was nuts, man. We talked about that uh, previously, but, bro, in leading up here to Tyson Norm, yeah, bro, you didn't have... Uh, a chance to even prepare, man, in a full camp. Yeah, uh, you probably ate, uh, ate, slept, trained one day, and and uh, next thing you know, you're walking down the fucking aisle, bro. Um, yeah, seriously, that's kind of how it felt. Like, luckily, I wasn't completely out of shape. I had gone back on the grind pretty quick, and I was training, but yeah. I wasn't in fight shape for sure. Because I mean, the week before that. The week before I accepted the fight, it was my daughter's birthday and we went camping for a weekend. So I drank beer for four days in a row. I had been telling my coach, I was like, bro, I can't remember. I don't think in my life I've ever had beer four days in a row. So, I mean, I was, I wasn't in fight shape. I was in shape, but I wasn't planning to get ready for a fight, but I, you know, I was still running and stuff while we were out there. I was still grinding. So uh, definitely no excuses. I could have been more prepared, but I still hold myself to that standard to where I think I should have went out there and beat Tyson Nam. I just made some mental errors and mistakes, but just got to capitalize and fix those mistakes moving forward. I mean, Jerome, man, don't even, don't be hard on yourself, bro. Like, the thing is, there is you, you smashed it in the first round. Yeah, first round, yeah, he didn't know where you were coming from. Um, your angles were on, were on point. Um, you know, and then the second round, yeah, bro, he, I don't know what, what he does, yeah, but he, he stays still, like, his footwork is not that great, yeah, but what he does, yeah, is he, he stays still and he loads it off, isn't it? So, when you were, when you were angling, that's when he caught you, right? and uh, uh, I don't know how he does that, but maybe it's just experience or something like that, yeah. but... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's but... what I was going to say. Hat, hats off to Tyson because that was a veteran move right there. I mean, he, huh. I kept hitting that inside leg kick. I was having success with it, and his corner told him next time he throws that, kind of dip your head in a little bit more. And he listened to his corner, and that's that's just the difference, I guess, sometimes, too, is just that life experience. You know, Tyson Nam has been in my shoes where he went and made those mistakes in the past, and he got knocked out for it, so... You know, I I uh, suffered a TKO loss and that sucked. But I honestly think the way I felt that first round, had I stayed with that laser focus and concentration, I have no doubt in my mind I could have beat that guy. And I think that's almost what led to my downfall is I got a little too excited after that first round because I was like, damn, I actually just went and, uh, and out kickboxed this dude for a round. I can do this for two more rounds. I'm not even tired. 
And right. so I kind of went out there on cloud nine at the beginning of that second round, just up here. I was like, oh, I'm going to move my head. I feel good. And I and it's just an old uh, lazy habit throwing that leg kick with the head on the center line. So now I'm never going to do that again. No, man. I mean, uh, bro, uh, let's rewind it a bit, yeah, Jerome, yeah? So let's go, yeah, like this. How how did you feel first, man? Uh, when you when you got the call, yeah, three days uh, before the fight, how did you feel first when you got the call? Man? Uh, I was excited, bro, and like it was almost like very surreal. Like I was kind of like in in denial, like uh, yeah, what had happened. I was at breakfast with my grandma eating a chicken fried steak, oh. and. <laughs> My manager calls me and he's like, hey, can you make weight uh, 135 and fight Tyson Nam tomorrow? He's like, we'll fly you out to Vegas right now. And I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, heck yeah, I can. Let's do it. And then uh, then he called me back like 10 minutes later. He's like, oh, hold the phone. Never mind. They don't want to do it. <clears throat> and then he's like, how about fighting uh, Nate Smith in November? So then yeah. I was like, oh, whatever. I was like, okay, we're going to fight in November. Went back to eating my chicken fried steak. And then I go to the gym and I'm there stretching out, rolling out, getting ready for strength and conditioning. And my coach just comes like running through the doors and like tackles me. And I could see like tears in his eyes. He's like, we fucking made it. We fucking made it. I was like, what do you mean, bro? I was like, I know we're fighting contender series again. He's like, no, I just talked to Jason. He's like, you're in the fucking UFC. I'm like, oh, shit. Pretty crazy, bro. I can't oh, believe shit. it. But even, even now, like for me, I feel like I'm not here until I get that first win. So. Yeah. I yeah. fought in the UFC, but I'm not a UFC fighter until I get that first win. So that's what we're going to do this next fight. Oh, man, you are. You're a UFC fighter, bro. You are, man. Yeah, so, uh, bro, because bro, cause you got you won the contender series. Yeah? Even though you didn't get the contract that night, yeah, it don't really matter. Yeah? Because you're still yeah. in the UFC, bro. Yeah? Like, Jerome, bro, you took... A fight, a UFC fight against the top fifteen flyweight, yeah, like like that, like in a blink of an eye, yeah, bro. So, so it was a, uh, and then walking down the aisle, bro, yeah, in the UFC, yeah. How the hell did that feel? It was an empty arena, yeah. But how did yeah. you even feel, bro? How does it feel when you're when you're in that arena? uh it, it's definitely a little different with no crowd um i had a lot it was more fun walking out for this one than contender series because contender series they don't put out no music or anything like that so <laughs> this one felt a little bit more real um but yeah bro like i don't know i'm just getting more relaxed and more comfortable in there i was kind of like waiting for those nerves to kick in i'm like when am i going to start like freaking out and i get yeah. in there and I, I felt fine i wasn't like abnormally nervous or anything i felt pretty focused pretty concentrated but damn that was a walk i was waiting for for a long time it's pretty cool to do that yeah man not for sure bro uh, the, the the thing is yeah jerome is bro everyone everyone dreams of that yeah bro that is that is the ultimate ultimate dream right is to uh is to walk out eventually in a big show yeah I mean, going up in Legacy, growing up in uh, Cage 3, wherever you uh, started out in, your ultimate goal is the UFC or Bellator, PFL, something like that, right? Where, where you've got millions of eyes on you. Yeah, bro, if you're not in that, in that frame of mind, my thought process is you're not ready. Yep. So, yeah, um, you gotta be, you got to be ready. Yeah, uh, straight up. Uh, when... Uh, I want to get your thoughts, bro. Yeah, and I uh, and I call this a, like sort of like a stroking the ego type thing. Yeah, bro. And um, I want I wanted to weigh in on this, yeah, bro. Um, is the after UFC 254, yeah, uh, when Khabib retired, yeah, bro. And um, it was uh, of course, bro. It was emotional. It was the whole deal, right? Um, but but Daniel Cormier said that. He would his career, bro, was the greatest career of all time. Yeah, uh, which I find uh, I, I was just talking, I was raving about this, yeah, bro, on on the website. I was raving about this everywhere, yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, bro, I what, what do you think, Jerome? Yeah, first of all, man, like what about that about that goat 
sort of discussion. Yeah, I, that's a that's a really hard one because I was thinking the same thing. Like when I saw Khabib that night, like I was thinking in my head, like, damn, this guy is like probably the greatest of all time. You kind of got to give it to him. And I was thinking that all the way up until I saw John Jones start tweeting some facts. Yeah. And then I kind of kind of put me into perspective a little bit. Like, damn, Khabib did only have three title defenses, which kind of I mean isn't doesn't compare to what John Jones has done. John Jones had a lot of title defenses, fought a lot of really tough guys, had a lot of finishes. But one statistic is Khabib never having lost a round or never having gotten cut in all those fights. Yeah. That is, that's something else. That's crazy. Just to think that at the highest level, all those killers he went against, Rafael Dos Anjos, Gleason Tebow, Abel Trujillo, nobody won a round against that guy. And nobody cut that guy. That's pretty freaking impressive right there. So, I don't know, though, bro. I mean, as far as just talking about who's more versatile, I think John Jones is a more versatile martial artist. But who would I rather have my kids look up to? And who's a black belt on the mats and off the mats? You got to go with Khabib. Yeah. Well, go with Khabib. Uh, man, John Jones, that dude is a freaking something else. That dude has some talent. Bro, the, the thing what I what I was raving about, yeah, is the fact that bro, the the goat discussion, yeah, everyone has their own opinion, right? You you can say that uh, Khabib's a goat. I can say John Jones. Another guy can say George Saint Pierre, or another guy can say Israel Adesanya or Hoist Gracie, uh, Ken Shamrock, yeah, anyone that came before, right? So, but I I. I don't think that. I think uh, between Khabib and John, but if you put all of John Jones's uh, mistakes that he made in the past behind him, right? Fuck the cocaine, fuck the deep uh, uh, wires and the firearms and shit. You can you can probably make the argument that he he is one of the the greatest mixed uh, modern mixed martial arts of all time. Right. Yeah, that's that's the impressive thing about John Jones. He just does it all. He could go and outstrike the strikers, go and catch black belts like Vitor in uh, Americana. Like he'd go and take down wrestlers like Chael Sonnen and Daniel Cormier. So, I mean, that was something special in itself to see. Yeah, man, and and uh, that's the thing. Yeah, bro, he he out wrestled Chael Sonnen. Yeah. Yep. He submitted Vitor when he hadn't even trained jujitsu for that fight. He he basically does everything uh, so well yeah, to roll that that you can't you can't really flaw the technique, right? Uh, mm. You can't flaw the technique. Not done those. Yeah, I think one thing that's going to play a factor in that though is. John Jones, let's see what he does moving forward because maybe he still, it seems like he thinks he still has another chapter left in his career. So, I mean, that could affect the whole GOAT status because if he comes in and he loses a couple fights, then all right, I'd probably say you can probably call Khabib the GOAT if Khabib stays away from the game. But if John Jones were to come and win like three or four fights and get to what, 29 and one or 30 and one, then I mean, you kind of got to give it to him at that point. Deep, especially yeah, if he goes up to heavyweight, I uh, hear yeah, for sure. Right? And the, the uh, to, to sort of wrap that discussion up, yeah, Jerome. Like I like I said, man, everyone has their opinion, right? Everyone types who they who they think's the greatest. Yeah. Uh, so I think, bro, there's not a legend. There's not one goat. There's not one pioneer. There's not one. Yeah. Icon, there's not one fucking future champion. There's not one nothing. Yeah, bro. There are fucking, there are legends, there are pioneers, there are icons, yeah, bro. More than one, more than one. Yep. Yeah. Just like in boxing, you can't, you can't give like a one specific goat in boxing either. There's just so many talented legends that came and performed night after night and were just dogs inside yeah. that ring. Yeah, it's just, it's hard to call one specific person the goat because I mean, another name that, we didn't mention that as Demetrius Johnson. I mean, oh, sure, yeah. he lost that last fight to Sehudo, but 
I yeah. honestly, I, I was a big, huge fan of Demetrius Johnson. I might have been a little biased. I kind of, I, I haven't rewatched that fight actually, but I remember the night when I saw that fight, I thought Demetrius won. And I mean, just talk about a guy that shows up every single night consistently and performs and sticks to his technique. That dude is freaking something else. He's a fucking savage. Like, he's a savage. Yeah, yeah literally. Yeah, and uh, it's Demetrius Johnson, you can throw into the conversation. Anderson Silva. Yeah. Yeah. Voice Gracie. Fucking everyone, yeah, that came before. John Jones, everyone that came before Israel, everyone that came before Henry Cejudo or TJ Dillashaw, Dominic Cruz even, bro. Yeah? People can say that, yeah. but uh, that's, what, that's what the point is, right, Jerome? is Like, everyone can, can say, anyone can say anything, man. Like, you might not agree with my choices. I, don't, I might not agree with yours. Yeah? And uh, that's it, bro. And... Uh, it can, it's a topic which pisses me off sometimes, bro. Yeah. Um, but, and then, like, some, some fighters worry a little bit too much about that status, too. Like, I know John Jones seemed like he got really touchy about it. Yeah. And the thing is, bro, like, you can't convince everybody. Like, people are all going to have their opinions. There's going to be people that are going to think he's better. There's going to be people that are going to think Khabib's better. And you just got to know in your mind your own self-worth and just say, you know, I'm fucking – a badass. I got to the UFC. I got the fucking championship belt. I mean, yeah, he's just got to know his own self worth and not let all these other people like chime in and affect you too much. Because even like social media in general, like I don't know, you just can't can't pay too much attention to it because people are always going to troll you and mess with you, especially when you're at that level like John Jones. Yeah, definitely, definitely, man. Um, that even even that year, Renegade is. Bro, the after you lost, yeah, so after let's go back here yeah, to you, yeah, because uh, this is what you're supposed to do, right? Yeah, if you want to prove that you're the you're the best, if you want to prove that you're committed, if you want to prove that you know what, yeah, I might have lost this fight, or there might be a debate between me and this guy, is you come in and you prove it, right? Yeah, not the lot of shit, yeah, and you go into the cage and you prove it. And, and bro, this is what, this is why I love, uh, I love talking to you, bro. And uh, um, it's because, bro, I, you didn't even need to call this uh, the retribution or the revenge of the renegade. Yeah? It's because there, there's no reason to call it a retribution. But you only lost one time, and it was, uh, and it was on three days' notice against a top fifteen guy, yeah, uh, and because. You were a number one contender for legacy, uh, legacy flyweight championship. Um, oh, well, I, I would, I would never be ashamed. Yeah, and yeah, and that's the thing. Bro. So, what have you been doing, Jerome? Because, bro, you've been busting your ass in the in the gym yes, sir. ever since. Uh, yeah. Has there been, uh, since that fight? Yeah, was there like a a fire that that got lit under you? Or uh, what, what, caused, what caused you to... Because, bro, you've always been in a drive. But mm. you went into overdrive, bro. Um, what, what caused that, that sort of adrenaline, man? Uh, like you said, bro, like there's, there's talking about it and then there's actually doing it. And, you know, like I was very pissed off after that last fight and very hard on myself and upset with myself but then like at the same time like I had to kind of take a step back and kind of give myself a pat on the back and say you know you made it here you did it you made a mistake uh, we already know from experience the world keeps turning now it's time to change things so this doesn't happen again so I just told myself the differences I was going to make in the off season. I took a couple weeks off and I just told myself this is your lifestyle now you know just got to go and make yourself better every day, go run every day, go box every day, go, I mean, you know, and have, and definitely have to have a science to it. I'm not overtraining and hurting myself. And that's what I take pride in now too. I'm training smart, but I'm also training a lot, working really hard making some good gains. Cause yeah, I want to do everything in my power to go make sure I win these next three fights. Cause I worked my ass off for the last 10 years to get here. And now I have an opportunity to, to create a life for, my family you know I want I'm thinking about big things now like I want to 
set my daughter up for school and you know I want to help get us a house and now all that stuff is coming into fruition so this is the time now more than ever that I got to work my ass off and just go hard and also like in that Tyson Nam fight I feel like sometimes when people get TKO'd or they get hit really hard they have a tough fight sometimes they kind of get shied away from it I had a kickboxing fight a long time ago where I got knocked out I got dropped and I remember for a few months after that, I was kind of like afraid to get back in the ring. I was like, damn, I don't really want to get hit again. But that Tyson Nam fight, even though I lost by TKO, I had a fucking blast in there. Like I had a great time moving around. You know, it didn't turn me off at all. I'm ready to get back in there. Now I realize like getting TKO, that ain't shit. That didn't even hurt. Like whatever. <laughs> I'm just going to make sure it doesn't happen again. I'm ready to go fight my ass off and start getting some TKOs myself and slap yeah. those wounds. Did it, did it light a fire more under your ass, seeing that you were going through such a hard path, yeah, to get to the UFC? Like, you were taking fights three days' notice. But then did you, did you, did it light a fire to see Brandon on the other side uh, do, win two straight? Yeah, like, did uh, that, did that do, did that say to you, look, Jerome, bro, there it was a long ago that you fought this kid? Yeah, and now he's doing this, and you're doing that. Yeah. Uh, did, did that go through your mind at any point, Jerome, or did I just bring you up and make shit worse? It's almost <laughs> like that David Goggins mentality. Like, I kind of have that chip on my shoulder where, where I'm kind of like, okay, this guy's got it easier than I do, but it makes me hungrier because I'm just thinking, like, damn, shit. If I would have gotten lined up to fight Tim Elliott on uh, out of shape Tim Elliott, and whatever that would have been a great fight for me and then you get lined up to fight Kai Car of France and then go and perform the way he did I mean definitely it's like damn I, like I just see the potentials there I was in the ring with that kid and I know I can beat that kid and uh yeah definitely lets a fire up my under my ass because then I'm just like <laughs> I'm I want to do what he's doing and I feel like I can't say he got an easier route though because I mean Kai Car of France is a fucking tough fight and he went out there and he performed. I was impressed. Brandon's fucking right. tough. So I, I want to get in the ring with him because I want to see what that fight's going to look like. Because I know me and him are a bad matchup for each other. And I want to go in there and see what that violence is going to come to. Kai, is, uh, Kai was number five for number four actually coming into that fight, man. That was nuts, bro. Like, that was crazy. Yeah. Shit. yeah. And no, uh, yeah, hats off to Brandon, bro. Yeah, he's, he's my boy, too. Yeah, that's... that's uh, that's some shit right there. I probably just stirred that shit up a little bit, yeah. Because uh, yeah, that's no, I yeah, I'm I'm coming for him. I'm I wanna. <laughs> I wanna and it's, not, it's not even beef anymore, you know. I was I like I thought I was gonna run into him at the fighter hotel, and I was gonna say what's up to him, have pull him to the side, and have a little conversation. But um, yeah, it's just motivating. I know he's a warrior. I'm a warrior, and I want to see us clash one day. So yeah, man, no, you, you can look at yeah, bro. That's a bright way to look at definitely. Um. You know, Jerome, when, as, a, as a fighter, yeah, bro, from a fighter's perspective, when you watch other fights, uh, when you watch the UFC or, or you know, if you just turn on a fight, yeah, to, uh, to watch or e even during your own fights, yeah, bro, um, do you, how, how important is it, yeah, say if you're behind going into round two or it's a last round, you know you lost two and you need to stop the kid, how how important is it to adapt your game plan to to do that? Yeah, bro. How important is it to come out? Oh shit! I did this wrong in the last round. I need to do this in this round. Uh, how how important is that? And how difficult is it, bro, to do? I think that's uh, very difficult. That's something that comes with experience and just having that high fight IQ. Because if you're losing the first two rounds, there's probably a reason for it. Maybe you were doing the same thing over and over I don't know maybe his advantages were um he was playing strong to his advantages maybe he's taking you down so that means that third round you got to go and change things up you got to go do something differently and you got to switch up that game plan a little bit maybe go to plan b or plan c and that's something that's hard to do when you're really tired you got a killer in front of you punching you in the face trying to take you down so to have the skill to go and be able to change your game plan up in that third round and come back that takes a lot of skill but it's not something that's impossible either i've been thinking about that and i'm seeing these guys that are down two rounds and they go into that third round kind of defeated 
and I'm kind of trying to picture myself there and I'm like, I know that if I come to that spot one day where I'm down two rounds to zero and we get to that third round, you got to push for that 10, eight round. You got to go from bell to bell and just put it on that dude. You got to get a knockdown. You got to take him down and mount him and do something. Cause I mean, looking boxing, those guys, like they take knockdowns and stuff like Lomachenko, he was down, whatever you might've called it. Uh, like yeah. going into those later rounds, he was down, but had he got a couple knockdowns, it, the would've fight would have definitely been back. way in his favor. Yeah, he would have come right back. You're yeah, right. he would have came right back. So you just can't ever give up that hope in yourself. And you got to also have that cage awareness and that fight IQ to know, okay, I'm doing this wrong. I got to switch it up. I got to go and do that. This is where he's capitalizing on me, which is very hard to do. I mean, bro, that, that's, that's it. Like, as a boxer, yeah, because you're using one tool, right? You mm-hmm. need it, yeah? So, so mixing up your combos, uh, you know, if you're the longer fighter, how do you keep using your range and how do you keep him guessing? Or if you're in MMA, yeah, bro, like, and, and I was thinking about your contender series fight when you did this, or when I was thinking about this question, because he wrestled you, yeah, bro, and you didn't, you didn't expect him to wrestle you, yeah? yeah. Like, you expected to just uh, to fuck him up, like, uh, use your combos, take him down, um use your jiu-jitsu but bro he was doing that to you and you didn't expect it um yeah how how did so how did you feel when did you did you adapt how did you adapt to that to that sort of uh, to that game plan jerome did you think all right cool i'm gonna let him take me down i'm gonna transition try get a choke or uh, i'm gonna get up and sprawl and brawl what was what was going through your mind when when that happened mm-hmm. In that fight, looking back in hindsight, um, I've grown in fight IQ from that fight. I think it, that could have been an easier fight for me had my fight IQ been a little bit higher. But I was uh, um, kind of just like, I don't know, we switched game plans. We had to make adjustments. You know, I went out there to grapple. He went out to strike and we ended up switching in the midst of the fight. But I do remember we came to a point in that third round where I told myself, you have to win this round no matter what. Like, this kid's going to keep trying to take you down. Don't get taken down. Don't let him bring you to your knees. Do something else. And I started trying to hit some switches in that round. And I I did hit two switches on him. So both times when he took me down, I ended up, like, he didn't hold me down. I hit a switch, and we got back up. And so, like, that was kind of, like, I wish the fight IQ would have been higher. But at that time, my fight IQ was high enough to where I told myself, you can't let him continue doing what he's doing. You got to switch something else up. And I started hitting those switches. Then those started giving me some success. And I was able to hit some good ground and pound from those positions. So I was able to switch up the game plan a teeny bit and make some adjustments. And I think that's what won me the third round was some of those elbows I landed on those switches and, and all that. But uh, yeah, that being switching up in the midst of battle is definitely hard. Oh, man, I mean, uh... Bro, that's it, and especially if you're behind, right? And you don't know that you're behind. Uh, that it must be harder, right? Because you're panicking, yeah, bro, and you're you're under pressure. Yeah. Um. So yeah, does that does that play a factor in it to know that you know you my corner's up my ass and I I'm I'm down. It's the last five minutes. What the hell do I do? Yeah. Does yeah. that. That must, that must be riding up your ass going into a last round. Yeah, it's like all, all of this, like every fight is just like a big, huge, like experiment in, of your brain. Like, how's your brain going to react? How is it going to benefit you this time? Like, are you going to make the right moves that cause you to win the fight? Or is your brain going to cause you to lose the fight? Like, it, it truly is 90% mental and 10% physical. Like, every time you go out there, you're going to like be thinking like, I don't know, just different different thoughts, different ways you pump yourself up before you walk out. Or maybe you're just trying not to pump yourself up and you're trying to stay more focused. Or maybe you want to get really emotional and really crazy. Like it's nobody knows what the right answer is. You got to find that for yourself through trial and error. And it's all just a big experimenting phase. Even when you're in there, like, I don't know, like when I fought Luis and I went to my corner after, I remember a way to pump myself up to make myself feel like I had more energy and make him feel tired. I started talking crap to him. I was like, are you tired? Are you tired already? <laughs> and so, I mean, that's, that was like a, a mental factor for me. And now 
now I know moving forward, like, I don't know, <laughs> that's just kind of how I am. I'm a little crazy like that. I like, I like pumping myself up, doing little yeah. things like that. So, oh, man, you were you were telling us about this on the on the triple threat as well. Uh, yeah. uh, you were like, hey, man, bring your fucker, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. That's um, funny. Uh, but yeah, man. Nah, I mean, that's all right, bro. Because because it, it can it can depend on a number of things, yeah. And uh, you you never know how this shit's gonna play out. Yeah, yep. you can have to go. You can either go one way, and then the next time, and then the next second you look, yeah, you could be uh, flat on your ass, yeah, or uh, yeah. flat on his. Right. So yeah, man. I mean, you're uh, you're right with that, man. I, when you when you look at um, a fighter's mentality, yeah, bro, and, and I wanna I wanna pinpoint the lightweights in this situation, yeah, bro. Uh, so so right now the UFC lightweight division is. Um, oh, bro, it's like uh, it's a, it's the Hunger Games, yeah. Let's put it that way. It's a fucking Hunger Games, yeah. Uh, Dustin Poirier, Michael Chandler, Tony Ferguson, Justin Gaethje, uh, Conor McGregor, yeah, bro. But I say fuck, fuck Conor McGregor, yeah, and put yeah, uh, uh, and put Charles Oliveira in that position, yeah, yeah? and then and then fuck Justin Gaethje because he just had a championship fight. Yeah, so I say put Dan Hooker in that position. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good put Dan one. Hooker. So that's your that's your five, yeah, bro. But they're not giving him a chance, bro. They're not giving him a chance at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so if you so Jerome, if you were gonna make a fight with those guys, yeah, here's here's what I said. Yeah, I said do Charles Oliveira versus Dan Hooker. Yeah. yeah, I said for the for the belt, do Tony versus Dustin. Yeah, and do Justin Gaethje versus Michael Chandler. Yeah, bro. I think that sounds like a pretty good lineup right there. Yeah, uh, if you were gonna if you were gonna do it, bro, yeah, uh, how would you how would you how would you line that up? I don't know. It's just kind of hard because it's hard to give it out of those five guys or six guys six guys. It's hard to say, okay, these two out of the six deserve to fight for the title, but these four, even though they're all so close, yeah, it's hard to kind of do that. So it's almost like you got to make a bunch of like number one contender fights, but <laughs> there's three, there's like six number one contender. I mean, three possible number one contenders out of that. And then you'd have to narrow it down again. And by the time they do that, it's unrealistic. So I don't know. Honestly, I don't think it, they would give Michael Chandler a title fight, his first fight in, even though he was going to do that as a replacement. But I think a good contender fight to test Michael Chandler, I would like to see him fight Justin Gaethje, honestly. That yeah. would be a scrap. I would love <laughs> to see that fight. Me and my teammates were talking about that. And then... uh Charles Oliveira and Dan Hooker, I think that's a good – that sounds like a scrap right there. I'd like to see those two. Yeah. And then what? Who would be left? Just um, – uh, You have Tony, Tony and, and Dustin. Tony Blake. and Dustin. So is, is that the same exact – that's the same lineup you named. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a good lineup right there, bro. Tony and Dustin. I mean, those guys, I think – That'd be a good lineup, but Tony's coming off the loss to Gaethje, so does Tony got to prove himself first? But, bro, what I said to him, uh, Jerome, is, bro, you got Tony, – Tony's been unlucky five times against Khabib. He hasn't had the fight. And then I felt sorry for him when he lost to Justin Gaethje, yeah, bro. He didn't get knocked out. He got just – he got decision, but it was a Justin Gaethje, bro, that is – he's a damaging, damaging guy. And it was what it was, yeah, man, in that fight. But I think Tony deserves it probably more than anyone. Yeah. yeah. And then when Dustin Poirier, he's coming off that win over Dan Hooker, and then he's coming off the loss to Khabib for the title. So, so I think that that makes sense for a title fight, man. Uh, but bro, following up, yeah, do you think that 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 is where the rankings can be a bit unfair? Yeah, bro, when a guy like Michael Chandler comes in out of fucking nowhere and he goes ahead of Charles Oliveira, he goes ahead of 
Dan Hooker, and he, he's put straight into the mix. Yeah, well, uh, because don't you think that, and even Conor McGregor, bro, where the hell did that guy even come from? Yeah, he was on a yacht yeah. doing, he was on a yacht doing, doing dope. Yeah, bro. Uh, and this guy comes out of nowhere and, like, he's, he's fighting Dustin Poy. Yeah. yeah well, Oh, yeah, yeah cool. that's where that's where it's kind of like I like what Anderson Silva said earlier in the week. That thing you posted, how it was a little more like family oriented when the Fertitas were there, yeah. and I feel like it was also a little bit more like you had to earn your shot. Like it wasn't you just come off the street and you're lined up for yeah. huge fights like that. You had to kind of fight your way there. Even Brock Lesnar, he didn't get a title shot right off the bat, right? Didn't he fight Frank Mir yeah, the, first? Yeah, three fights. Yeah, three fights. Yeah. Before. Yeah, so I mean, you can't just come in off the streets, a new cat, and just be lined up for a title fight. They got to have him prove himself a little bit. But that's the sad thing where the sport has gone to nowadays is it's the guys that are going to sell the tickets that are going to get those big fights. So, um, you know, we've had, right, we've had a lot more battles on Twitter than we've had inside the cage. Yeah. Uh, John Hope versus Israel Adesanya, the, the 100 round social media war. Uh, then you have John Jones who's been on the mic ever since UFC 253. Yeah? UFC 254. And even now, bro, that guy talks. Yeah. Um, but but he you can argue that he talks real. Yeah. And then uh, other things there yeah, you can see that I right, cool. That guy has just crossed the bridge. Yeah, and you shouldn't ever cross it. Like when he mentioned Israel Adesanya's mother I mean, yeah, I'm from Nigeria, yeah, bro. Yeah, man, Jerome, how do you, where do you think, yeah, that is, that there's a line to cross, right? Yeah, when you talk shit about someone on social media. But, but do fans ever take note of that? Or are they too busy uh, seeing what, what's being said? Yeah, I think like, kind of like I was saying earlier, like, you got to just be about it. Like, talking is one thing and, like, selling a fight, cool. But, like, all that stuff on Twitter, like, unless you're a real fan of MMA and and you're going on MMA Mania or MMA Reloaded or whatever and you're seeing what those tweets getting posted, like, most people aren't going to see that stuff anyway. So I don't get why these guys go so hard on each other in these Twitter battles. (laughs) It's like save it till you see each other in person and save it for the for when it's i mean hype it up when they have the cameras on you and you're trying to hype up the fight for the interviews but i mean just going back and forth bantering each other through twitter is like not. i don't know it's you just got to be about it got to quit talking about it if you guys don't like each other let's then fight each other don't just keep talking shit for days yeah that's it man. that's it and uh that's, that's the best word man because why? Because John Jones, if he's gonna go heavyweight, yeah, go heavyweight, bro. Yeah. Exactly. So if you want to fight Israel, fight Israel, man. Yeah. If Israel wants to fight for the light heavyweight championship and uh, fight Jan Blakovic, yeah, bro, fight Jan Blakovic. Um, because bro, yeah, you, they were chatting, they were chatting bad shit about that. They were chatting so much shit about that, bro, and um. Oh man, it's just it's one big crazy ass uh sport, bro. And that's uh yeah that's that's the thing, it, man. That's Yo, the thing. that's the thing is yeah, if you really don't like each other that much and it's real legitimate beef, then yeah. say it. My next fight is gonna be Israel. I'm not fighting nobody else. And Israel say, Okay, you wanna talk shit, you gotta mention my mom. I'm not fighting nobody else but John Jones. And John Jones say the same thing. If you guys are really about it, if not, then you guys just look like a bunch of little Twitter soldiers talking <laughs> crap to each other. And so uh, that's why I like the whole thing with, like, Brandon and stuff. Like, you know, I wasn't going to sit there and talk all kinds of shit back and forth on social media. My thing was, when I see you, you're going to know it's on. And then when we fight, we'll settle it in the cage. But I'm not going to waste my time just digging that far into your personal life and talking about your mom and this and that. It's like, that's silly. Yeah. No, oh, fuck that, man. You don't, you don't want that. Yeah, bro, fight is fight and talk is talk, man. Um, now, Jerome, bro, it's, uh, I wish you all the best of luck. Yeah. 
I wish you all the, all the best of luck going into January 21st against Ode Osborne. Um, and this is where I, I feel that your UFC career starts. It starts right here. Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, it's a full camp. Yeah. Two months. Yeah, bro. Uh, let's do this shit, man. Um, yes, sir. Uh, tomorrow night, Anderson Silva fights his last fight. Yeah, bro. In the end of an era thing, bro. He ends up 14 years. No, wait. I think, yeah. 16 years UFC career. Yeah, bro. Um, you play a hall. Yeah, bro. Um, I would say it's another part of the torch type thing. Yeah, if you will. Um, ah, bro, my voice sounds like something stupid. <laughs> let me just, uh, let me keep talking. I sound like a robot, man. Um, <laughs> All right, there you go. That sounds better. That sounds a lot better. Um, yeah, bro. I mean, your fire hall, I would say, is is another Israel Adesanya in terms of, you know, being uh, popping the torch. Yeah, bro. Too. He's that type of special talent, right? Um, yep. How do you feel this one's gonna go? I know it's gonna be an emotional fight. Probably the greatest of all time, Anderson Silva. Um, or one of the greatest in this land versus a guy who I think is a future champ, future Hall of Famer, then you're right Hall, man. That's a hard one, bro, because I love Anderson Silva. And when I first uh, I first started watching UFC and I'd gotten in a street fight, I had got this guy in a clinch and I remembered Anderson Silva's fight and I was like doing these skip knees that I'd seen him throw. And so, like, my style was heavily influenced by Anderson Silva when I first started. So, I love watching that guy fight, but I just – I don't want to see it happen, but I just have this terrible feeling that Uriah Hall, that dude's a specimen. He has power. He has some crisp, <laughs> diverse striking. Yeah, and I honestly think Uriah Hall is going to catch him slipping with – maybe finish him TKO. Uh, probably second round is what I'm going to say. Ooh. Well, I don't know, second or third round. I don't, I mean, I would love to see Anderson Silva win, but I just have been thinking about it. I'm getting this terrible feeling your eye hole might finish. Wow. So, I don't know. Yeah, either way, it's been one of the greatest careers, one of the most decorated careers of all time. Um, and it's Halloween Havoc. Yeah, bro, tomorrow. Uh, bro, bro, I, it, it's always a pleasure with you, man. It's always yes. a fucking pleasure. Bro. It's great um, chatting with you, bro, and ready to go get that W. Like you said, this is the real start right here. Now I got a real go get that W, man. Get that W. Got three months to get ready, bro. It's going to be a scary renegade come January 30th. Get that W, man. Um, yes, sir. I'll, bro, I... Hey, I wish you all the best of luck. Good luck training. Uh, yeah, bro. And, um, uh, we, you know, we speak on Instagram anyway, bro. Yeah, so so we're cool. Um, but, uh, man, thank you so much, Jerome, man, for coming back on the show, um, providing uh, uh, such a mature insight, man, above your years. Thank you so much, bro. Yes, sir. Thank you, bro. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, we'll be chatting soon. I'm um, on you too, man. Thank you Later, so much. Bro. Have a good one. You too, man.